Harper Audio presents Beyond Belief My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape by Jenna Miscavige Hill with Lisa Pulitzer read by Sandy Rustin Prologue Rays of morning sun poked through the clouds as I stood toward the back of the line of children, waiting to meet two important adults in the Church of Scientology. I didn't know exactly how long I'd been there, but it seemed like forever. At seven years old, minutes seemed like hours when I was waiting for something. There were at least ten kids ahead of me, so my two friends and I were singing songs and playing handclap games to pass the time. Although I was certainly giggling along with them, I was mostly distracted and anxious. The two visitors were recruiters from the church's international headquarters in Hemet, California, and they were standing at folding tables that had been set up along the road to the schoolhouse. I'd been too far back in line to hear the exact explanation of why the two had come to the ranch, the Scientology boarding school where I lived with about 80 other kids whose parents were executives of the church. Whatever their reason, I figured it was important or they wouldn't have made the 20-mile trip from the base to speak with us in person. Dressed in naval-style uniforms, complete with lanyards and campaign bars, they looked impressive, even powerful. I knew they were members of the Sea Organization, Scientology's most elite body, comprised of its most dedicated members. My parents had joined the very same group years earlier, just before my second birthday. Several songs later, my turn to approach the tables was upon me. The faces of the two recruiters were stern and intimidating. Eager for adult attention, I tried to please them by being cute and smiley. When they did not seem impressed, I changed my tactic and tried instead to seem smart and inquisitive. One of the two handed me a sheet of paper bearing the Sea Org coat of arms and the word Revenomous, printed at the top with places for dates and signatures at the bottom. What does revenomous mean, I asked, most curious about that. It is a Latin word meaning we come back, the recruiter responded. She further explained that it was the official motto of the Sea Organization, seemingly pleased for the opportunity to enlighten an eventual candidate. Come back to where, I asked. We come back lifetime after lifetime, she explained. You are signing a billion-year contract. Oh, right. I said, realizing how silly and ignorant my question must have sounded. As Scientologists, we believed that when our current body died, the spirit inside it would begin a new life in a new body. Our founder, L. Ron Hubbard, said that, as spirits, we had lived millions of years already, and we would continue to do so with or without bodies. I had believed this as far back as I could remember. On this day, I was all too willing and ready to commit myself to the cause that was so dear to my parents. Being in the Sea Org had meant so much to them that when I was six, they had placed me at the ranch so they could dedicate all their time to the church's mission. They only saw me for a few hours on weekends. Nobody's parents were at the ranch to share the moment we pledged our loyalty to the Sea Org. Signing this document, though, meant I would be one step closer to joining them in the Sea Org and hopefully to seeing them more frequently. Where should I write my name? I asked eagerly. The woman pointed out the spot, but directed that I read the document first. The unavoidable final line was, Therefore I contract myself to the Sea Organization for the next billion years, as per Flag Order 323. Before I signed, images from the Little Mermaid flashed in my mind, particularly when Ariel signed the Sea Witch's magic contract. I knew that contracts meant I had to keep honest to my pledge, so I made mental notes of the things I was agreeing to, following the rules and mores, forwarding the purpose, and serving a billion years. I can do this, I said to myself. And with that, I tried to write my name in my best possible cursive with the proper connectivity of letters, exactly the way I had been learning in school. 
I wanted my signature on this important document to be perfect, but the recruiters were rushing me, still having to enlist the rest of the children behind me. As a result, my signature didn't turn out as nicely as I had hoped. Still, I had goosebumps as I walked away. Nothing about the billion-year contract was strange to me. I knew that my parents were with me in spirit, wherever they were. My contract was the same commitment they themselves had signed for the first time when they were teenagers. Besides, at my young age, I had little understanding of larger numbers. To me, a billion years was no different than a hundred years, both an unfathomably long time. If I wanted to be with my parents and friends for the next billion years, the obvious thing to do was to sign my name. One by one, my friends wrote their own names down on their contracts, each pledging his or her service to a cause that none of us could possibly fully understand. As I stood there in the road between the playground and the pink and white oleander trees, I didn't know the true significance of what I had just done or the full extent of the expectations that would now be placed on me. Just like that, I had gone from singing down by the bank with a hanky-pank to full-on committing my soul to a billion years of servitude to the Church of Scientology. Whatever my future held for me, one thing was now certain. My life was no longer my own. Chapter One In the Name of the Church One of my earliest memories of Scientology was a conversation that happened when I was about four years old. At the time, my family was living in Los Angeles in an apartment that had been provided to us by the church. And one Sunday morning, I was lying in bed with my mom and dad, wondering what it would be like to be out of my body. How do I go out of my body? I asked. My parents exchanged a smile, much like the one my husband and I share when our son asks one of those difficult questions that can't really be answered within his frame of knowledge. Can we all go out of our bodies together and fly around in the sky? I asked. Maybe, my father responded. He was always eager to indulge me. Let's do it now, I demanded impatiently. Just tell me what to do. Okay, just close your eyes, he instructed. Are they closed? Now, think of a cat. Do we all think of it at once, I asked, wanting to make sure I was doing it right. Yes, was Dad's reply. Okay, one, two, three. With my eyes closed, I waited. But nothing happened. I could hear my parents laughing, but I didn't understand what was funny and why they weren't helping me. Were they not allowed to help me out of my body? Could they only help at certain times? Could I only get out of my body when I was older? Was something wrong with me? I knew I was a Thetan. I had always known I was a Thetan and had never believed anything else. Thetan was the term Scientologists used for an immortal spirit that animated the human body, while the body itself was essentially a piece of meat, a vessel that housed the Thetan. A Thetan lived lifetime after lifetime, and when the body it currently inhabited died, it picked its next one and started over again. The idea of having past lives fascinated me. I would often ask grown-ups to tell me stories about their past lives. I couldn't remember any of mine, but I was always assured that they would come to me eventually. My father's secretary, Rosemary, would tell me things that had happened in a past life of hers when she had been a Native American girl. They all sounded so amazing and romantic to me. I couldn't wait until I could remember one of mine. I hoped I hadn't been a bad guy or a solitary old man. Surely, I must have been a princess at least once. Back then, as young as I was, that was what Scientology seemed to be about. Past lives, leaving your body behind, being a Thetan. Beyond that, there wasn't much that I knew about it, but for a child who really couldn't understand the layers of complex belief, there was an excitement to it all. I was a part of something bigger, something that stretched into the past and the future, something that seemed impossible and yet somehow was completely believable. And so... I sat there, eyes closed, waiting to fly around the sky with my parents at my side, waiting to leave my body behind. I didn't know then that only Scientologists believed in Thetans. Everyone I knew was in the church, 
and as a third-generation Scientologist, my life was Scientology. My grandmother on my mother's side had started reading books by L. Ron Hubbard, the science fiction writer and founder of Scientology, in the mid-1950s. On my father's side, my grandfather had come into the church in the 1970s when an acquaintance told him about it. They'd each gotten hooked right away. In Scientology, there was no God, no praying, no heaven, no hell, none of the things that people generally associate with religion. It was a philosophy and a self-help program that promised greater self-awareness and the possibility of achieving one's full potential. This unconventional self-help quality was precisely what drew both of my grandparents to it. Each, in their own way, liked Scientology's focus on controlling one's own destiny and improving one's life through a series of clearly laid-out steps. Each brought children in, nine on my mom's side and four on my dad's. Once my parents joined the church as children, they stayed. By the time I was born in Concord, New Hampshire, on February 1st, 1984, they had been Scientologists for more than 15 years. From my first breath, I was a Scientologist, but it wasn't until shortly before my second birthday that the church actually began to shape the course of my life. That was when my parents decided to give up the life they had started in New Hampshire, move our family to California, and dedicate our existence to service in the church. Prior to that, we had been living in Concord, where my parents had built their dream house, a four-bedroom, two-bathroom, wood-and-glass home on a parcel of land. Mom and Dad both had well-paying jobs at a local software company, and my nine-year-old brother Justin was a fourth grader in the local public school. At least on the outside, our family had all the markings of a normal, suburban existence. All that changed in the fall of 1985, when my father, Ron Miscavige Jr., went to Scientology's Flag Land Base in Clearwater, Florida. Covering more than a few city blocks, the Flagland base was a massive complex that served as the church's spiritual headquarters, a place where Scientologists from all over the world gathered and stayed for weeks to months. My father went down for a couple of weeks, and on this particular trip, the clergy of the church, known as the Sea Organization or the Sea Org, was in the midst of a massive recruitment campaign. The Sea Org recruited and employed only the most dedicated Scientologists, who were willing to devote their lives to spreading Scientology to all mankind. L. Ron Hubbard had created the group in 1967 aboard a ship called the Apollo, which he referred to as the flagship. L. Ron Hubbard was a Navy man and had a passion for naval traditions. The word was he had taken to the seas to research the spiritual component of Scientology without interruption or interference. There was speculation that he had moved into international waters to avoid accountability to the United States Food and Drug Administration after some of his medical claims, such as applying his teachings could cure psychosomatic illness and other physical and psychological ailments, had been criticized by members of the medical community who debunked his miracle cures as fraudulent. Regardless of the reason he operated at sea, he mandated that the members of this special group wear naval-style uniforms and gave the Sea Org its own Navy-like rank and rating system, which set its members apart from other Scientologists. He went so far as to have crew members address him as Commodore and high-ranking officers as Sir, whether they were male or female. He even selected his own group of personal stewards within the Sea Org who ran programs, related his orders, and followed up to make sure they were carried out. He called this important group the Commodore's Messenger Organization, CMO. In 1975, the Sea Org moved onshore to the Flag Land Base in downtown Clearwater, where members lived and ate communally and facilities provided them. Even though the organization was no longer stationed on ships, it still kept the naval terms from its sea days. Living quarters were berthings, staff dressed in naval-style uniforms, and L. Ron Hubbard was still the Commodore. Ten years later, this was where my father found himself in the midst of the all-out recruitment effort. Dad later told me there were Sea Org recruiters stationed at various locations around the base looking for young, successful, competent, ethical Scientologists. Anyone who entered the Sea Org would have to sign a billion-year contract that bound their immortal fate and spirit to lifetime after lifetime of service to the Sea Org. Its members also had to work grueling hours, seven days a week, 
with minimal time off to spend with their families, often for as little as $15 to $45 per week. Qualifications for membership included having never taken LSD or angel dust, having never attempted suicide, and having no anti-Scientology immediate family members. My father had once been a member and felt he still fit the bill. He was a dedicated Scientologist, he was willing to make the full commitment, and he was the older brother of David Miscavige, one of L. Ron Hubbard's top executives and a rising star in the church. At only 25, my Uncle Dave was chairman of the Board of Author Services, Inc., which oversaw all of the financial aspects of L. Ron Hubbard's copyrights, texts, and intellectual property from his writing. Like my father, Uncle Dave had been a Scientologist since my grandfather had introduced the family to the church. From the start, Dave was so passionate that, with my grandpa's permission, he dropped out of high school at 16 to join the Sea Org. When my father returned home to New Hampshire, he informed my mother that he had decided to accept re-recruitment into the Sea Org. Although my parents had been in the midst of settling down, he again felt the calling and wanted our family to move to the church's Los Angeles base, where we would begin our new life. Mom would have to re-enlist in the Sea Org as well, as Sea Org members could not be married to non-Sea Org members. Without hesitation, my mother agreed. As impulsive as this was, my parents knew what they were signing up for. Not only had they both been in the Sea Org before, they had first met at the Flag Land base when each was only 19. At the time, they had each been married to someone else in the Sea Org. My father had a stepson, Nathan, and my mom had two-year-old twin boys, Justin and Sterling. My parents became romantically involved, got in huge trouble for it, as it was a violation of church policy, and had to work hard to make amends for their behavior. Eventually, they got permission to marry, and Mom's ex-husband remarried too. Sterling lived with his dad and his dad's new wife, and Justin lived with my parents, but both twins were able to spend time in both households, an arrangement that made everybody happy. My parents made a handsome couple. My father was five foot eight, slender but strong. He had sandy hair, a mustache, blue eyes, a warm smile, and was an all-around friendly guy. My mom, Elizabeth Blythe, known as Biddy to everybody, was beautiful, five foot six, and quite slim. She had hazel green eyes and brown hair that came down to her waist. Her ivory skin had just a few freckles. Unlike my father, she was a smoker, and had been since she was a teenager. Around strangers, she was shyer and more reserved than my dad, but when she was with her friends, she was confident, blunt, and funny, with a very dry sense of humor. Mom was opinionated and sometimes judgmental, but also an amazingly capable woman. Even with the huge time commitment that the Sea Org required, my parents had actually been happy there until the late 1970s, when they started getting frustrated with the management at the Flagland base. In 1979, after being in the Sea Org for five years, they both quit. While that was a breach of their billion-year contracts, at that time leaving was not catastrophic. They were allowed to remain public Scientologists, loyal to the church, but without the full-time commitment of service to the Sea Org. For years after they had left, my parents' lives were normal. They lived in Philadelphia with my dad's parents for a bit before moving up to New Hampshire, where they lived a typical middle-class life, two working parents with job security, Two children at home, they'd retained full custody of Justin after they'd left the Sea Org, a nanny for the daytime, and a house built to order. Much of our extended family, including my father's sisters, Lori and Denise, and my grandmother on my dad's side, was also living in New Hampshire, and we were on a path to settling down surrounded by family. It seemed like rejoining the ranks of the most diehard devotees of Scientology could not have been farther from my parents' minds. And yet... With one rash decision, they did just that, returning to the Sea Org and putting all of our lives on a drastically different path. What my parents knew at the time, and what I would only learn later, was that being in the Sea Org meant that they would spend a lot of time away from me. But that didn't change their decision. The church was their priority, and their minds were made up. Later, my parents would tell me that their decision was made spontaneously, without much thought, and in hindsight, it was the worst decision of their lives. While I can't say whether they considered the impact that their choice would have on me, most likely I was just one of the many sacrifices they were willing to make in the name of the church. 
they had quit once. So perhaps they figured that they could leave again if it didn't work out. Another part of their thinking may have been that they really believed it would be awesome to raise a child in Scientology, because I would experience Scientology from the beginning of my life. There was likely a restlessness in them, a feeling that something was missing. They preferred being out in the world on an important mission and serving some higher purpose than being in New Hampshire, working nine-to-five jobs and raising children. They were motivated by the church's mission and they wanted to be involved in something bigger. One thing is clear to me. That decision was when normal stopped having a place in our lives. There had been an opportunity for our lives, for our family, to look very different. My parents considered that future, then walked away from it. Chapter 2 L.R.H. Drops His Body Living in California was going to be a Miscavige family reunion of sorts as my dad's father, Grandpa Ron, and my dad's brother, Uncle Dave, already lived there. The year before, my grandpa had also succumbed to the recruitment effort when he decided to leave Philadelphia and join the Sea Org. Meanwhile, Uncle Dave, who'd been a rising star in the church for years, was quickly becoming one of the most powerful figures in all Scientology, and what none of us knew then was that, before long, he would be leading it. On December 11, 1985, after a long cross-country drive, we arrived at our new home, the Pacific Area Command, PAC, base in Los Angeles. The first Church of Scientology had been established in the city in 1954, and L.A. still had one of the largest populations of Scientologists anywhere. The PAC base was comprised of many buildings within walking distance of each other, most of them along Fountain Avenue, Franklin Avenue, and Hollywood Boulevard. The blue building at 4833 Fountain Avenue was the heart of the PAC base. Once Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, it was the most recognizable church building in the city. High on its roof was an eight-pointed cross, a religious symbol of the church, and the word Scientology in huge letters. At night, they were lit up and visible for blocks. The seven-story building now housed the church's administrative offices, some staff housing, and the galley and mess hall. Uncle Dave and his wife, my Aunt Shelley, had an apartment in the Blue Building, although their main residence was two and a half hours away at the church's international headquarters in Hemet, California. Our first apartment was in the Fountain Building on Fountain Avenue, a block from Sunset Boulevard. It was in a somewhat dodgy area of Hollywood with some crime and known gang activity. The apartment consisted of two dingy and dark rooms, each about 15 by 15 feet, and one bathroom. The smell of mold hung in the air. In an attempt to make the place nicer, my parents had the original chipped linoleum floors covered with carpet. They also went to a nearby discount store and bought a bunk bed for Justin and me as well as some other furniture, placing the bunk bed in one room and their bed in the other. I still preferred to sleep with my parents in their bed. Those hours of sleep with my parents were just about the only time I had to be with them. The typical Sea Org member was required to be on duty for at least 14 hours a day, from about 9 in the morning to 11.30 at night, seven days a week, with a break for an hour of family time in the evening, when parents were allowed to see their children before heading back to work. On occasion, they would get a day off for Liberty, or Libs, but Libs was not a guarantee. At most, it was one day off every other week. It was a reward for good performance. As arduous as the days were, my parents didn't complain. My dad's office was conveniently located across the street from our apartment. He had been assigned a management post in a branch that dealt with computerizing Scientology, known as INCOM. In Scientology, almost every division, building, office, department, or base was identified by an acronym. Even the job positions or posts and the courses we took used them. L. Ron Hubbard himself went by the acronym of his initials, L.R.H. My mother was put in charge of the ship project, a massive venture involving the purchase of a new ship to be used as a floating base. It would be called the Free Winds and would operate much like the original flagship Apollo had during the early days of the Sea Org. Because my parents were working long days and nights, Justin and I were watched by other caretakers. When we first got to L.A., I spent my days at a nursery in the Fountain Building, 
where I stayed until my parents came to pick me up for dinner, which was served in the mess hall. Afterwards, Mom, Dad, Justin, and I would go back to the apartment for family time. I was taken back to the nursery when Mom and Dad went back to work. There were plenty of cots and cribs where the children could sleep until pickup time, which was typically 11 p.m. or later. During the day, when I was at the nursery, Justin went to the Apollo Training Academy, ATA, another building on Fountain Avenue. The ATA was for older children of Sea Org members. They were considered to be cadets, basically Sea Org members in training. I didn't know what they did there all day, but Justin hated it enough that he begged my parents to let him go back to New Hampshire where his friends were. Justin's and my daily routine soon became normal. I was too young to understand that seeing your parents only one hour a day was highly unusual. I didn't know what parents were supposed to do. I only knew that mine were seldom around. We had only been in Los Angeles for six weeks when on January 24th, 1986, L. Ron Hubbard died at the age of 72. He had been living in seclusion in a remote area of the desert in California for the previous six years, tended to by a married couple, Pat and Ann Broker, his two closest confidants. He hadn't been to the base or made public appearances in years, but everyone said he was actively working on new, groundbreaking research, so his isolation had been understandable. To Scientologists, L.R.H. had always been respected as a researcher and philosopher whose stories about his discoveries for the church were riddled with colorful tales from his own travels and life experiences. By the time of his death, he had become almost godlike, a charismatic figure who developed the path to salvation for all Scientologists. Everyone viewed him as a personal friend, whether they knew him well or not at all. To us, he saw the good in all mankind. L. Ron Hubbard had been a prolific writer of short pulp fiction tales for 15 years before he published his first serious work, Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health, in 1950. Dianetics was a self-help program, and the philosophy behind it was that people had to get rid of moments of pain, which were obstacles to personal growth. These moments were what held us back, impaired our health, and undermined our quality of life. However, by addressing and overcoming them, we could conquer just about anything that made us suffer. When it was released, Dianetics quickly sold millions of copies, with readers becoming rabid fans of the program overnight, saying this new guide to mental health was filled with amazing ways to heal and improve your life. Of course, Dianetics also had its skeptics and outright critics who questioned the alleged science used by LRH. For his part, LRH dismissed his naysayers as feeling threatened by his new perspective. Despite the naysayers, Dianetics became such a sensation that LRH opened Dianetics centers in cities across America so that people could engage in one-on-one -on -one study with a trained coach whom LRH referred to as an auditor. In these sessions with the auditor, the student, or pre-clear, was guided back to his painful moments. They could be anything physical or emotional, from childbirth to a car accident or any kind of actual moment of pain, as well as the sights, smells, emotions, and words heard or associated with that painful moment. L. Ron Hubbard believed there were chains of painful moments, and with an auditor's help, they would disappear one by one. The goal of Dianetics was to address each and every one until finally the mind was cleared of the entire chain. Dianetics was a continual process of locating such chains, of which there could be thousands, and following them all the way back to the earliest incident. Only then would they disappear, bringing the pre-clear closer to a state of clear. When you were clear, the goal of Dianetics, you no longer had psychosomatic illnesses, neuroses, or psychoses. You also experienced a giant lift in IQ and had perfect recall of your past. You were free of what LRH called your reactive mind. By 1952, L. Ron Hubbard had moved past thinking of Dianetics as simply a self-help regimen. In his research, he had discovered that pre-clears were demonstrating chains of painful moments that preceded their current lifetime. In fact, they could go back many lifetimes, indicating the possibility of past lives, which naturally opened the door to the realm of the spirit. This led LRH to another discovery, that man existed in three parts, the body, the mind, and the spirit. He called the spirit the Thetan, 
it was immortal, and it was also the most important of the three parts. Without it, there would be no body or mind. A Thetan wasn't a thing, but rather the creator of things and the animator of the body. The mind was the computer, the body was the vessel for the Thetan, and the Thetan was the life force. Thus, Scientology was born. The Thetan quickly became a vital part of Scientology. By offering followers a spiritual component, LRH took the first step toward making Scientology a religion, a designation that came with a variety of benefits. Suddenly, the claims of dubious science that had surrounded Dianetics were irrelevant. If Dianetics was part of religious practice, it didn't need to be proven scientifically. There were also financial incentives and tax exemptions that made becoming a religion attractive. However, perhaps the most important part of Scientology becoming a religion was that, unlike Dianetics, in which people could simply become clear, get fixed, and never return to another auditing session, Scientology, with its infinite spiritual component and its journeys into past lives, was designed to keep people coming back indefinitely. LRH developed a curriculum that specified the order in which Scientology was to be taught. This step-by-step -step program was called the Bridge to Total Freedom and was divided into two parts. Auditing, which was a type of one-on-one -on -one counseling, and training, a program by which to learn how to audit others. Under this roadmap for Scientologists in their journey to spiritual freedom, everyone had to start at the bottom and move up one level at a time. You could go up one side of the bridge or both. There were also many courses that weren't actually on the bridge available to Scientologists as well. But as for the ascent itself, a person had to attain a certain level of awareness before he or she could advance to the next level and ultimately cross the bridge to total freedom. The levels on the bridge up to a state of clear were based on LRH's Dianetics research. However, with the discovery of the Thetan, he had to decode the spiritual levels beyond a state of clear. These became the highest levels on the bridge, known as the Operating Thetan, or OT levels. There were eight levels, the final one being OT8, enticingly called Truth Revealed. LRH warned that no one could bypass any level to get to this ultimate mystery and said proper preparation was imperative. Doing levels out of order, he claimed, could result in serious injury or even death. For this reason, people who had already achieved this knowledge were forbidden to share it with those below them on the bridge. Additionally, the OT courses could only be delivered by specially trained Sea Org members. A number of Sea Org bases around the world could deliver OT levels up to level 5. The Flag Base in Clearwater delivered levels 6 and 7. The Free Winds, the ship my mother was preparing for service, was going to be the only place in the world that would deliver OT-8, the highest level yet decoded. Even though LRH spent his last years in self-imposed exile, he let it be known through communications from the brokers that he was hard at work on advanced, never-before-revealed levels beyond OT-8. The day after LRH's death, both my Uncle Dave and Pat Broker addressed a capacity crowd of Scientologists at the Hollywood Palladium, the 40,000-square-foot Art Deco-style concert hall on Sunset Boulevard. Uncle Dave told everybody that LRH had moved on to a new level of research. There were a few gasps of disbelief, occasional muted applause, but mostly the auditorium was in total silence. Dave went on to explain that it had been L. Ron Hubbard's decision to discard his body because it had ceased to be useful and had become an impediment to the work he now must do beyond its confines. The being we know as L. Ron Hubbard still exists, he told his followers, helping to diffuse the shock. The fact that LRH had orchestrated his own journey, combined with the fact that he hadn't been seen in years, made his departure bearable. Since both my uncle and Pat Broker were on stage that day, it wasn't immediately clear who LRH's successor would be. Reportedly, there was a power struggle between the two men over who would assume leadership of the church. There were opposing stories of exactly what transpired, but accusations emerged that my uncle used some questionable tactics to oust Pat from the leadership position. Regardless of how it happened, in the end, my uncle prevailed, eventually becoming the head of the church, with his official title being Chairman of the Board, Religious Technology Center. From this point forward, 
everyone in the church referred to him as C.O.B., but to me, he was just Uncle Dave. My father, Ronnie Miscavige Jr., was actually three years older than Uncle Dave. He was the oldest, followed by Uncle Dave and his twin sister Denise, and Lori, the baby of the family. When they were kids, my dad and Dave shared a room and got along well, even teaming up to play pranks on their sisters. Dad was very athletic, and although he played football in school, his real passion was gymnastics. He even landed a place on the junior Olympics team in his region. Dave also enjoyed sports, but because he had asthma, he was sometimes held back from competing and doing other physical activities. Denise was kind, free-spirited, and loved to dance, but she was often in trouble with my grandparents because they didn't approve of some of the boys she dated. Little Lori loved to dance along with her big sister. Their father, my grandfather, was Ron Miscavige Sr. He had been born and raised in Mount Carmel, a small coal mining town in southwest Pennsylvania, where he grew up Polish Catholic. He worked as a salesman, selling things from cookware to insurance. He wasn't particularly tall, but he was loud, gruff, gregarious, and a little intimidating. He joined the Marines when he was just 18, and in 1957, the year after he was discharged, he married my grandmother, Loretta Godaro, a beautiful young woman with thick brown hair, olive skin, and the brightest blue eyes. Grandma Loretta was a coal miner's daughter of German and Italian descent, who was humorous, kind, and always looking out for the welfare of her family. The two settled in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, outside Philadelphia, where she worked as a nurse until taking time off when her children were born. Dad in 1957, David and Denise in 1960, and Lori in 1962. Being in sales, Grandpa was very much a people person. He would frequently invite characters home to have dinner with the family, where they would tell their entertaining stories over a nice meal. It was through a fellow salesman that he first heard about the Church of Scientology. He wasn't drawn to Scientology because he had a particular personal issue, but rather because he was always hungry for answers about spirituality and our minds. At the time, he was 34, but he had always been interested in philosophy of one kind or another. When he was just a kid, he'd read The Prophet by Khalil Gibran and became fascinated by the questions about human life and spirituality that it raised. Early on, he'd been curious about social anthropology, how humans came to be here, and why we did the things we did. This interest in the origins of man led him to visit a local Scientology mission in Cherry Hill and buy one of L. Ron Hubbard's books. As Grandpa would later say himself, after that trip to the mission, he needed no convincing. He was sold. After buying a few more books, he went to the mission and began the auditing process. He said that in the next few months, the benefits of Scientology helped him become the top salesperson in his company, and he claimed he was even featured in Newsweek for his success. His boss was so impressed that he sent the whole company of 20 or so employees down to the Cherry Hill mission, because if this was what Ron was doing, they had better check it out, too. For her part, Grandma Loretta didn't object to his interest in Scientology. In fact, she liked it and started taking services at the mission as well. Pretty soon, Grandpa was bringing all four of his children for auditing, beginning when my father was 12. In addition, Grandpa had heard that Scientology had produced promising results in treating ailments such as asthma, so he thought Dave could really benefit. According to Grandpa, Dave's improvement was impressive, further convincing him that Scientology had the answers he had been looking for. It had helped him succeed at work, made him feel better about important decisions, and now it appeared to be improving his son's health. Ultimately, Grandpa liked that Scientology was more of a self-help philosophy than a religion. He liked that instead of discussing heaven, hell, and sin, it promised breakthroughs in relationships and marriages, careers, communication, and physical and emotional well-being. He also liked that there was a utopian quality to Scientology. It held the point of view that man is essentially good and in charge of his own spiritual salvation, but that salvation depended on a cooperation with the universe. L. Ron Hubbard felt it was possible to clear the world of human misery, end wars, and promote harmony. It was idealistic but somehow rational at the same time, a combination that appealed to Grandpa. The fact that it was unlike any religion or belief he'd ever known didn't bother him in the least. Two years after he discovered the church, he took a leap. He decided to sell his three cars and use the money to move the entire family to St. Hill Manor in Sussex, England, 
where the church's main headquarters had been located for more than a decade. In 1959, L. Ron Hubbard and his family had moved to Sussex and bought a 50-acre estate with a mini castle from the Maharaja of Jaipur, which became the headquarters of the Church of Scientology. St. Hill soon became a gathering place for Scientologists from around the world. L.R.H. was often there, always continuing and discussing his research, which gave people the feeling they were at the forefront of something new and important. Despite Grandpa Ron's desire to be close to the center of the Scientologist's world in St. Hill, my 14-year-old father was skeptical. Understandably, he wasn't that interested in moving from Pennsylvania to England and leaving his friends in the middle of high school. More important, he would have to give up his gymnastics and his dream of getting to the Olympics. However, my grandpa was doing what he felt was best for the family, and reluctantly, my dad went along with it. Those couple of years in England succeeded in fully committing my father to Scientology. After being surrounded almost exclusively by Scientologists, he became increasingly devoted to the cause, so much so that at 17 years old, he enlisted in the Sea Org and moved to the Flagland Base in Clearwater. Uncle Dave joined him there in 1976, after quitting high school on his 16th birthday to devote himself to the religion. In Clearwater, Uncle Dave began to work closely with L. Ron Hubbard and was rewarded for his efforts with important posts. Eventually, he was based at the International Headquarters in Hemet, California, where he quickly rose through the ranks to the point that, during L. Ron Hubbard's self-imposed exile, Uncle Dave had become a powerful figure in Scientology. Now, with L. Ron Hubbard's death, he was more than just the face of the church. He was the head of it all. Chapter 3 the greater good. About a year and a half after my uncle took over the church, the fountain building where we lived was severely damaged in an earthquake and subsequently condemned. My family moved nearby to the Edgemont building on Edgemont Street, where the apartments were much nicer. Each had two bedrooms, a small dining area, a kitchen, and a small living room. But even though they were bigger, each apartment was occupied by two families or two couples, so they were crowded. We shared our apartment with Mike and Kathy Rinder, old friends of my parents who were also dedicated Sea Org members. Mom and Dad occupied one bedroom, and Kathy and Mike had the other. Justin and I shared the living room on bunk beds and couches with Mike and Kathy's daughter, Taryn, and their son, Benjamin James, BJ for short. Taryn was around 10, a little younger than Justin. BJ was a few months older than I, but by then, we were both two. My mom had met Kathy when they were both teenagers and stationed on the Apollo, where they became good friends. While it was a bit odd to suddenly have another family around, I enjoyed Kathy's great sense of humor and the fact that she drew silly cartoons in which everyone looked like a pig. Mike was a bit different. An Australian, he was quiet and, like my parents, rarely in the apartment. We had no reason to complain that the apartment was crowded. It was fun having so many people around, especially so many kids. Because the earthquake had taken out the fountain building, BJ and I had to go to a large daycare kindergarten center for children of Sea Org members located on Bronson Avenue, next to what is now known as the Celebrity Center. It was far enough that we had to take a church-provided bus. About 80 to 100 kids went there, from infants up to age 6. We were divided into different classes, not so much by age, but by our parents' status in the church. Most afternoons, I rode the bus home with Justin or Taryn, who was also in the ATA. They boarded when we stopped at the academy to pick up the students there. On some days, my brother would take me off when we stopped at the ATA, and we'd walk back to the apartment together, stopping for push-pops from George's general store across the street from the ATA. While Justin was a little young to be watching me, the Edgemont was a Scientology building, and perhaps my parents took comfort in knowing that there were other Scientologists in close proximity and that their offices were right on the block. Additionally, there was a roving nanny on duty in the building who would stop by the various apartments and check on the children and was available in case any emergency arose. Over the months, BJ and I were becoming really good friends, despite the fact that he was into bugs and robots and I was into Barbies and baby animals. He wasn't a big talker, but I was fascinated by him. He was always teaching me some new fact about bugs or doing a new magic trick. We did pretty much everything together, and it didn't take long for BJ, as well as Taryn, to become like family. Shortly after we all moved in together, 
we started to see less and less of Mom. Because she was getting the free winds going, she was often on location in Curacao, British West Indies, where the ship was to be based. If she wasn't in Curacao, she was at the international base in Hemet. She would visit when she could and bring me presents from her travels. Although I loved the gifts, especially the small painted musical jewelry box with a tiny spinning ballerina, they didn't make her absence any easier. Family time was when I missed her the most. Usually it was just Dad and Kathy who came to the apartment for the hour. Dad would bathe me, read me stories, and we would play. That was how the routine went for about a year. The four of us, Justin, Taryn, BJ, and I, formed a makeshift family of our own. Although they weren't yet teenagers, Justin and Taryn were babysitters to BJ and me. Together, we hung out, had snacks, and played around. They generally looked after us until our parents came home for dinner or had a day off. All that changed, though, one day in early 1988 when Kathy came home at family time. That particular evening, I saw her speaking privately with BJ, who looked upset. From where I sat on the couch, I could hear Kathy tell him this would be their last daily family time together. From now on, she and Mike were only going to be able to see him once a week, on Sunday mornings, since the rest of the week they were going to be somewhere very secret doing important things for the church. Even though we were just four years old, BJ and I were both used to the Scientology explanation that our parents gave us about why they had to work so much. They would explain how they had to help lots of people and sacrifice personal time for the Scientology cause. We nodded our heads that we understood, pretending that the explanations would make us miss them less. Now, though, looking at BJ's face, I knew there was no way he could pretend to not be devastated. He didn't talk a lot, and as his mother carefully laid out what was going to happen, he just listened and stared at the floor. Afterward, I tried to comfort him by putting my arm around him and telling him how sad I was for him, but all I could think was how unlucky he was to lose this cherished hour with his parents. That's when Kathy told me that my parents would no longer be coming home at family time either. I don't believe you, I told her defiantly, but when I paused to think about it, I realized I had only been seeing my parents less and less during the week for the past few months. While my mom was often traveling, my dad, bit by bit, had been coming less and less frequently in the evenings on weeknights. From what Kathy was telling me, this separation was now official. As it turned out, my parents had already relocated, and I hadn't even realized it. A series of new policies had been enacted by the church that severely restricted the amount of time Sea Org families could be together. For instance, Sea Org couples were no longer allowed to become new parents. If a Sea Org woman did become pregnant, the couple had to leave the Sea Org and go to a non-Sea Org mission, which was a demotion. There, they would still be on staff and work at a Scientology church, but they wouldn't be allowed back in the Sea Org until the child was six years old, and even then, they would have to reapply. For Sea Org members who already had children, there were changes as well. On the positive side, their kids would be accommodated with improved facilities for care and schooling. But on the negative side, the nightly family hour was essentially canceled, and children over the age of six would be raised communally at locations close to Sea Org bases. While Uncle Dave hadn't written these policies, it was impossible for him not to know about them. They weren't the kind of changes that could have happened without his approval. It was hard to say why they did happen. Uncle Dave never had kids himself, which probably played a role. I've always believed not having children was a conscious decision on his part, as he had married Aunt Shelley before this rule was put into effect. Perhaps, through other Sea Org members, he saw how much work kids were, and the facilities and personnel they needed. Most likely, though, it was because kids were a distraction that caused the parents to become less productive and more emotionally invested in something other than the church. I never doubted that my parents loved me. I accepted that the time they had for me was extremely limited. Even now, looking back on their dedication to the church, I have no doubt that its teachings played an enormous role in their putting their Sea Org responsibilities before their family at all times. In many ways, they sacrificed family for what the church considered to be for the greater good. In Scientology, we said, the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics meaning that when making decisions, Scientologists had to use a basic Scientology principle called the dynamics of existence 
to determine exactly who and what any decision would benefit. There were eight dynamics of supposedly equal importance. One, self. Two, family, children, and sex. Three, group. Four, mankind. Five, plants and animals. Six, messed universe. Messed being matter, energy, space, and time, the physical universe. Seven, the spirit. Eight, God or supreme being. When my parents re-enlisted in the Sea Org, they knew their service would mean focusing on dynamics three, four, six, seven, and eight. They believed their work would serve each of those areas. Had they chosen their family, they would only have satisfied the first and second dynamics. As a result, because the Sea Org satisfied five dynamics and their family satisfied only two, it meant joining the Sea Org was the right decision. It offered the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. In truth, this dynamic system meant that families and children were usually unable to compete with the church's larger mission. In most religions, families and children were a central part of the religion's quest. In Scientology, they were subjugated by it. Similarly, the long hours and low wages of Sea Org employees were for the greater good of Scientology, and as long as the greatest number of dynamics was served, then it was right, even if children and families became collateral fallout. Being four years old, I wasn't sure how to deal with the idea that Mom and Dad were no longer living with us. They had already moved to the International Management Headquarters, also referred to as INT, the INT base, or the gold base. The only thing I knew about it was that Uncle Dave and Aunt Shelley lived and worked there. Located in Hemet, California, about two and a half hours east of L.A., the Int base was shrouded in mystery to the point that its actual location was kept secret even from family members of those who worked there. Only people who received special clearances were allowed to go there. The church said the security and secrecy were to protect the Int base from any outside enemies who might try to hurt Scientology. They said that these suppressive persons hated that we helped others, so they had to keep it confidential. In actuality, I think it added a sense of superiority to those who were important enough to know its location. Also, with the intrigue, there was an air of importance to the subject matter of Scientology. Mom and Dad told me they had their own quarters in an apartment complex near the base for the time they lived there during the week. On Saturday nights, my parents would drive back to L.A. to visit. They'd only stay until Sunday morning because they had to leave around 11 for their drive back to Hemet. Every week... I would be upset to see them go, although I tried hard not to show it. Justin never cried, so I tried to behave like him. My mother used her executive clout to arrange for a regular guardian for me. Her name was Pat, and she was a member of the Sea Org. A lot of kids with parents at Int stayed in the after-school nursery overnight, but because I had Pat, I was allowed to sleep at the apartment. During the day, Pat worked at the Manor Hotel on Franklin Avenue, which was part of Scientology's Celebrity Center. With Mom, Dad, and Kathy and Mike Rinder no longer home on a daily basis, our schedule changed a bit. BJ and I still took the bus to and from the nursery every day, but we didn't go straight to our apartment in the afternoon. Instead, our teachers would take us to another apartment two doors down from ours that served as an after-school nursery. Eventually, my brother or Taryn would pick us up when they got home from the ATA to take us to our apartment. The roving nanny was still on duty, so there was an adult available to us, if we needed anything. Pat would arrive there sometime after seven and spend the night with the four of us. By default, she became BJ's nanny, as well as mine. As much as I missed Mom and Dad, the time away from them wasn't always bad. Some days, Taryn would invite her friend Heather, whose parents were also at Int, to our apartment. I loved pretending I was a princess, so the two girls would dress me up in costumes and fancy dresses fix my hair, give me a wand and a crown, and make me beautiful. Justin also liked to invite friends over. Mike, the son of our father's secretary, Rosemary, and Teddy, a friend whose mother worked with Mom on the ship project, were two of his favorite guests. They would practice their karate on BJ and me. We would pillow fight them back. Teddy and Justin liked to go skateboarding, and they'd bring BJ and me along to watch. My father made it down to Los Angeles most Saturday nights, Usually he would try to make the weekend visits as special as possible by bringing me little gifts or doing something fun with me on Sunday mornings. Sometimes we would relax at home, 
but at other times we would go out for breakfast, hang out at Griffith Park near the Santa Monica Mountains, or look around the mall. Because of her work, my mom was able to come less often. One Saturday night, though, she called ahead and told me that she and Dad had a surprise for me. I tried to wait up, but I had fallen asleep by the time they came in. The next morning, I ran into their room. Where's my surprise? I asked excitedly. Mom reached under the bed and pulled out a kitten, a silver tabby, absolutely adorable, but scared to death. I named her Sarah Kitty. At first, BJ and I were scared of her because she was vicious, but eventually we made peace with her. BJ and I were at the apartment one afternoon when Sarah Kitty suddenly came sprinting out of the dollhouse to investigate a newcomer, a boy around Justin's age whom I had seen around the base before. He had barely stepped into the living room when Sarah Kitty dashed up to him and climbed him as if he were a tree. He was screaming, partly in fear and partly in pain at having been scratched, so BJ and I ran to grab her. Once we had her and our laughter under control, we stood staring at the boy wondering who he was. Justin was home and made the introductions. This is Sterling, he said to me. He's your brother. I knew that Justin had a friend named Sterling, but I didn't know that he was actually his twin. He and his family had been living in L.A. for several years and were also members of the Sea Org. It took me a while to get used to the concept of having another brother. Although Sterling and Justin looked nothing alike, they both loved sports and got along fairly well. He even started picking me up from the nursery some nights and stayed until Pat arrived. Dad, Mom, or both left L.A. every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. When they left, Justin and I liked to be outside to wave them off. I'll never forget the Sunday when my parents were backing their car out of the garage and B.J. and I were riding the garage gate. My leg got caught in between the bars as it was sliding to the right to let the car out. Justin tried to pull me off, but I misunderstood his intention and thought he was teasing me, as usual. The gate had no safety stop, and my leg got stuck between the gate and the wall, and I was trapped. In unbearable pain, I started to scream my head off. My dad jumped out of the car and literally bent the metal bars with his bare hands to free my leg. I was crying uncontrollably as he carried me to the elevator and back upstairs. My parents called the local Scientology doctor, who instructed them to ask me to try to walk. When I couldn't do it because of the pain, she told them that unfortunately my leg was probably fractured and that I should get an x-ray in the morning. Mom and Dad stayed with me for as long as they could, but they had so many urgent phone calls from Int that they were unable to stay past dinner. Someone in charge insisted that they come back to the base, even though he knew I was seriously injured. Orders had to be obeyed, and my parents reluctantly went. The ramifications for insubordination were significant and depended on the wrath and power of the person you disobeyed. My parents didn't want to displease their senior and suffer the consequences. After all, it was for the greater good. After my parents left, Pat remained with me and took me to the doctor's office for an x-ray the next morning. My knee was indeed fractured. The only thing the doctor could do for me was to wrap it in an ace bandage. I was back at the nursery two days later. My leg hurt so much that my limp caused me to lag behind during our daily strolls along Franklin Avenue. Rather than slow the group down, the teacher would become irritated at me and tell me to hurry up. She seemed to think I was putting on an act. BJ defended me, telling her that my knee was fractured. Well, if you fall behind, you are going to get left behind, she scolded. She told me that I needed to make it go right. This was a common Scientology saying, which referred to the church's belief in mind over matter. All I had to do was not let the pain dominate my thoughts, and it wouldn't feel as bad. A few months passed before my knee finally stopped hurting. Right before my fifth birthday, Justin told me he was leaving L.A. and going to live at a place called The Ranch. I didn't know what The Ranch was or where it was, but I didn't want him to leave me. I already saw so little of Mom and Dad. He said it was close to where they were living, and he would come and visit me once in a while, like they did. To make things worse, Taryn was going too. I didn't know how to feel, but I didn't like it. Now, with no one to pick us up, BJ and I had to stay at the after-school nursery, where we waited for Pat, who would usually come to get us around 8 p.m., except on Thursdays when she had to work late, often past midnight. 
All the kids at the after-school nursery ate dinner sitting on the kitchen floor, took an evening shower, played a little, then went to bed on one of the cots lined against the wall of the living room. This was where I first learned about touch assists. We were taught to perform them on each other before bedtime each night. We would be paired with another child and instructed to use one finger to touch him or her on the arm. The touch assists were procedures created by LRH to put the Phaetons into better communication with our bodies, so as to improve the healing process. Feel my finger? I would say to my partner, who was supposed to say, yes. I'd say, good, and repeat the exercise on the other arm. We would all do this on each other's fingers, toes, arms, legs, and face. I didn't totally understand the concept. I just knew the touch assists helped put me to sleep. While many of the kids stayed there overnight, BJ and I got a pickup when Pat took us home and put us in our own beds, or my parents' bed, where she would sleep with me. She was amazingly nice, and I loved her very much. On Sundays, she would pick us up at the apartment and take us back to the nursery after my parents left for Int. Every few months, Pat or Rosemary would take me to an international Scientology gathering, which was usually held in the Shrine Auditorium, a huge entertainment hall and expo center on West 32nd Street. Hundreds of Scientologists and Sea Org members, some from the Los Angeles area and some from the Int base, would be in attendance. Pat would always dress me up and curl my hair for the occasions. Together, we'd sit in the audience and listen to the speeches. I didn't know what the presenters were talking about, but my father would often be one of the featured speakers. Seeing him at the podium, I would get so excited that I would scream out, Hi, Daddy! I'm over here! And wave madly. If my Uncle Dave spoke, I was equally animated and would yell, Uncle Dave! It's me! It's Jenna! When I would see them in the green room afterward, they would tell me that they had winked at me or waved with their pinkies when nobody was looking. I had no idea how important these events were, but they always went on for several hours. They were filled with standing ovations and loud, long cheers, and the reception had great food. BJ and I had been living in Los Angeles on our own for a little over a year when Pat told us that we were going to be moving to the ranch where Justin and Taryn were living. We were both thrilled, even though we didn't know why we were leaving L.A. It turned out that someone had been shot right in front of the Edgemont building, so my parents insisted that I be taken to the ranch immediately, and naturally BJ would be coming too. The next morning, we packed up our stuff and waited for Rosemary, Dad's secretary, to pick us up. When she arrived, BJ and I climbed into the back seat, anticipating that Pat would get in too. But she didn't. Why are you standing there? I asked. When she broke the news she wasn't coming with us, I was shocked. We both started crying. We had been together for two years, and I was devastated. Although I knew that at the ranch I might be able to see more of my parents, I was still really emotional. I had spent more time with her than with my own parents. I told her how much I loved her, and I promised to visit often. After one long last hug, I got into the car, and Rosemary pulled away from the curb. Chapter 4 the ranch. It was a long drive to the ranch. At first, BJ and I were excited and chattering, but after a while boredom set in. I fell asleep briefly, and I woke with a jerk of my head smacking against the window, the result of the car hitting a bump on the winding dirt road we'd apparently turned onto.